latest tax plan. Will Congress send it to President Trump to sign before Christmas? This is real relief. This relief gives people a simpler system and a fairer tax code. As GOP leaders push their measure to overhaul the tax code, we'll discuss the bill's prospects and what it means for you with Secretary of the Treasury Stephen Mnuchin. Then, Thank you. Democrat Doug Jones wins in Alabama, putting even more pressure on the GOP to pass tax reform before he gets to the Senate. It would be wrong for Senate Republicans to jam through this tax bill without giving the newly elected senator from Alabama the opportunity to cast his vote. We'll sit down with the senator-elect in his first appearance on Fox News since the start of the campaign. Plus, lawmakers question whether political bias has taken over special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. How with a straight face can you say that this group of Democrat partisans are unbiased and will give President Trump a fair shake? We recognize we have employees with political opinions, and it's our responsibility to make sure those opinions <clears throat> do not influence their actions. We'll ask our Sunday panel about new documents the White House says show extreme bias against Mr. Trump. And our Power Player of the Week, a photojournalist who has risked her life to show what's happening in the world's most dangerous places. They were about to execute us and were literally, at one point I looked over and I saw each one of my colleagues literally begging for, for their lives. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. Republicans appear ready this week to pass the most sweeping overhaul of the tax code in three decades. Opposition among GOP holdouts has melted away, and party leaders in Congress are looking to hand President Trump his first major legislative victory. In a few minutes, we'll discuss what the plan means for American families and businesses with Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. But first, to correspondent Peter Ducey live on Capitol Hill with a preview of both the tax vote and the effort to avoid a government shutdown before Christmas. Peter. Good morning, Chris. The next movement on this tax bill comes Tuesday when House lawmakers hope to pass the bill and send it to the Senate where the math gets a little tougher. The count there is expected to be so close that the Vice President Mike Pence has delayed a long-planned trip to the Middle East just to be available to cast a tie-breaking vote if necessary. But President Trump is confident that it gets done by the end of this week. We have a tremendous spirit for the tax reform. This is going to be one of the great Christmas gifts to middle income people. There are still seven tax brackets under the new plan, but the rates are lower until 2025. The new top rate for top earners drops from 39.6% to 37%. The child tax credit doubles to $2,000 per child, and the standard deduction nearly doubles as well to $12,000 for single filers, which means that fewer people are expected to itemize their deductions. There is a new $10,000 cap on deductions for state and local taxes. The mortgage interest deduction will be capped at $750,000, and Obamacare's fine for people who don't want insurance under the individual mandate disappears. So, the first half of this week, Republicans will try to transform the tax code, and the second half of the week, they are going to have to try to keep the government funded. There will be a government shutdown next weekend if they can't figure out how to do that by Friday night. Chris? Peter Ducey reporting from Capitol Hill. Peter, thank you. Joining me now is the Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, and welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Great to be here with you, thank you. Can you say flatly that Congress will pass this tax plan this week and send it to the President to sign before Christmas? I can, it's a historic moment and we're excited to be here. And you have no doubts that Congress will pass it this week? I have no doubt. This has been a terrific process with the House and Senate working together in conference. And uh, there's a terrific bill that's going to get to the president to sign. All right. Let's run through uh, uh, several aspects of this terrific bill, as you, as you put it. And the first one I want to deal with is fairness. Here's what Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer had to say about it this week. God bless wealthy people. I'm glad we have them. But they don't need a tax break. 
And let me pick up on that because critics note the tax rate for top earners drops from 39.6% to 37. The corporate tax rate is cut from 35% to 21, and the owners of so-called pass-through companies get a 20% deduction. The Tax Policy Center analyzed the earlier Senate bill, which did not even have all of those provisions, and said the top tenth of 1% of taxpayers would get 42% of the benefits. Question, Mr. Secretary, do wealthy Americans Americans need all of those tax breaks. Well, Chris, first of all, the reason why we're lowering the top rate is because we're getting rid of lots and lots of deductions. And there's a big part of the country that has state and local taxes that we're getting rid of. Matter of fact, Schumer's been complaining about taxes going up on rich people in New York. So it's just not the case that there's all those taxes going to rich people. And what about all, all the other aspects of it and the analysis for the Tax Policy Center, 42 percent of the benefits to the top 1 percent? Well, I don't agree with those numbers. What this is all about is middle income tax cuts. Matter of fact, I researched you grew up in Chicago. The median person family that makes $50,000 is going to get extra money back, close to $2,000. And a family making $150,000 in Illinois is going to get over $4,000 back. That's very meaningful. And people are going to see these tax cuts starting in February because we have the IRS already working on new tax tables. But Again, just to push this question of fairness, and, and I take your point that because of the fact that you're doing away with most of the state and local deductions, that's going to be a tax increase for people in high tax states like New York or California. But still, we're talking about a family that makes over $600,000 a year. Do they need to have their taxes cut from 39.6% to 37%? And in the, in the so-called pass-throughs, because of the deduction that you're going to give them, you're going to get a situation where a lot of the employees who work for those companies will be taxed at a higher rate than their bosses. Well, let me just say, pass-throughs are the engine of growth in this country. And this is about creating the lowest tax rate for pass-throughs since the 1930s. That is going to be massive, massive economic growth. And it's about fixing a broken business tax system. We've had one of the highest corporate rates in the world, with companies leaving trillions of dollars offshore to, so that they don't have to pay taxes. This is a historic event to fix a broken tax system. But what about the, the point I just made? that you could end up with employees of these pass-throughs. And these are companies that are not formal corporations, and they end up, the owners of them, end up paying their taxes through the individual tax rate, not the corporate tax rate. The idea that you could have employees paying at a higher tax rate than the owners of those companies. Chris, you know, it's a very complicated tax system, and this is about simplifying it. So the reason why we have the pass-through tax break is because we believe there'll be about $4,500 in wage growth that will go back to work. So this is, this is all about creating a tax system that's good for workers, good for working families. Uh, let's talk about the, the point you just brought up, because that was one of the other aspects uh, that was a big selling point, that you're going to be making the tax code simpler. And in fact, there was an event that I want to show where President Trump met with top congressional leaders and talked about this is going to be so simple, you're going to be able to file your tax return on a postcard. Take a look. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but analysts say that in fact the GOP tax plan, you didn't end up cutting out all of those deductions, makes the tax system more complicated for millions of Americans, especially those involved in these pass-through companies who are, are, are going to ha have an even more complicated tax system to deal with and are not going to have any chance of looking at filing on a postcard. Chris, that's just not the case. I couldn't be happier overseeing the IRS. Over 90% of Americans are going to fill out taxes on that postcard or a virtual electronic postcard. This is about simplifying taxes and simplifying the business system. So there will always be people who complain that are losing tax breaks, but this is about making it simple for the American public. I, I want to press on that because that's a, that's a new number. I'd heard that originally, but I, you're still saying over 90% of Americans would be able to file 
on a postcard. Absolutely. They'll take the standard deduction and that's what they'll file with. And we're in the process already of designing new forms so that Americans don't have thousands of pages of tax forms. Let's turn to the deficit. Your Treasury Department issued a one-page statement this week that was pretty controversial. You said the combination of tax cuts, rollback of regulations, infrastructure and welfare reform will not only pay for tax reform but reduce the debt net by $300 billion over 10 years. But the nonpartisan Joint Committee of Taxation, the, the, the analysts for the Congress, say even assuming growth, the tax plan adds $1 trillion to the deficit. And the head of the Committee for a Responsible Budget says that no one should believe the one point, the one paid statement that your Treasury Department put out. Chris, I've been through these numbers, so let me walk you through them before, okay? They're rather simple. Okay, first of all, we've said all along that the joint tax numbers underestimate growth. So they predict about 500 billion of growth. There's a trillion and a half dollars of tax cuts. There's 500 billion that are the difference between policy and baseline. That takes us down to a trillion. If you look at the other 500 billion, that joint tax agrees, that gets you down to 500 billion. Their growth numbers are just too low. By the way, the Obama administration in the first four years predicted GDP of 3%. When they left, they predicted GDP of 2.2%. Now everybody is saying we can't have 3%. We've had 3%. What Treasury put out is consistent with what I've said. The difference between 2.9, which is our conservative number, and 2.2 is over $1.8 trillion. And that's what the report shows. Now, the president, as he was on the South Lawn on Friday, started talking about, no, actually, I guess it was yesterday when he was on the South Lawn, said four, five, six percent growth. You're not really going to, you don't really believe that, do you? I think we could have quarters of four, five, six percent growth. I don't think we'll have that over 10 years, and that wasn't what the president meant, but we will have periods of high growth. We've already seen it if it weren't for the hurricane. And, uh, and you think that. This tax bill is going to turbocharge the economy to that extent? Absolutely. You've already seen this. You see the stock market at record highs. You see average workers that see their 401ks go up. They already have more money for savings. They're going to get more money in their pockets. This is going to be the largest change in fixing a broken tax system that we've ever had. People said we couldn't do it. We will do it. And I couldn't be more excited to see the president sign it this week. In the time we have left, I want to talk to you about two other issues. President President Trump is going to release his national security strategy tomorrow, and there are reports that in it he will accuse China of engaging in, quote, economic aggression. How is China an economic aggressor, and are we headed for a trade war with Beijing? Well, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of it, but I have been working with the president on it. I was with the president and vice president at dinner last night at Camp David, and he's excited to give the speech tomorrow. And uh, China, we are in an economic competition with China. As the president has said, we don't have fair trade. We have a big trade deficit. He's made that very very, very careful discussions with President Xi. We want to have a more balanced and fair trade relationship with China. But is it going too far to call them an economic aggressor? And doesn't that lead to the potential for a trade war? Uh, I'm not going to comment on what's specifically in the speech. I would say this isn't about trade wars. This is about reciprocal fair trade. And if we have to protect American workers and put on tariffs or other things where they're not, they don't have fair trade with us, the president will do that. So you're laying open the door to new tariffs on China. I think we said that we will look at where they are not having fair trade. We will look at whatever means we need to combat that for the American workers. Finally, the federal government is due to run out of money on Friday. Uh, will Congress find a way to keep the government funded or I mean, can you rule out a shutdown the two days before Christmas. I can't rule it out, but I can't imagine it occurring. Uh, I would expect that both the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, understand that if, if they can't agree on this, they need to have another short-term extension to move this to January. We can't have a government shutdown in front of Christmas. What would the impact be if there were a government shutdown? Well, I'm not even going to comment on the impact. I just can't imagine sending government workers home for Christmas. So I, 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 I hope that Congress gets this done.
final question is somebody who's relatively new to Washington when you talk about a two-week extension another two-week extension is this any way to run a government well that's something we'll talk more about Chris hopefully we'll look at reforms for different things next year Always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. I appreciate that you take our questions and you answer them and answer them directly. Sec Secretary Mnuchin, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Always good to talk with you, sir. Great to be here. Thank you. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to drill down into the Republican tax plan and what it means for you. Hello and welcome. Enjoying the video? Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe for more HD video. You can join us on our live stream. The link can be found on the screen or in the description below. And don't forget the 2018 NASCAR season starts real soon, so ring the bell so you can be ready live on race day. Enjoy the rest of the show. Will unleash the American worker. They will tear down the restraints on discovery innovation and creation and they will restore the hopes and dreams of the American family. Millions of middle class families will win under our plan. President Trump promising the Republican tax cuts will transform the American economy. And it's time now for our Sunday group. Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review. Columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams. Former Democratic Congresswoman, Donna Edwards. And Brian Kilmeade, co-anchor of Fox and & Friends and author of the best-selling new book, Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans. And I have to tell you, People who know us know that Brian and I, Brian just admitted that he has never seen a Star Wars movie. <laughs> I understand that. So please send your emails and facts. You know, my life is still fulfilled. You know, I can still live my life. And you, seen, so much but you, you don't know, you don't know what you're missing. All right, Rich, <laughs> let's start with the two central questions about this Republican tax plan, which by all accounts is going to get passed. Is it good for the economy? Is it fair to middle-income Americans? I think it's good for the economy. It, on the corporate side, these are major changes that will bring our system more in line with other advanced Western economies. And they will definitely be pro-growth. There's a debate about how much pro-growth they'll be, but they'll definitely be pro-growth. And on the, with the middle class, this bill, I think, has been a victim of a smear that it's somehow going to raise all sorts of taxes for lower and middle-income people. And it's just not true. Almost everyone gets a tax cut under this bill. One of the exceptions is relatively affluent people in blue states who will lose their state, uh, much of their state and local deduction. Otherwise, everyone's going to get a, a big minus in their tax bill. Uh, let me ask the same question to Congresswoman Edwards. Uh, good for the economy? fair to working class Americans? Well, I think clearly um, it's a boon for corporations and for the super wealthy. I mean, this tax bill really gives them a huge benefit. But for middle class families, I mean, I, I urge people to do what I did and it's simply, you know, put your income in a calculator and start running some of these um, changes to the tax code. And I think a lot of middle class families are actually going to find that it's either going to be a wash for them or they're actually going to end up paying more taxes depending on where they live. What specifically do you worry about in this bill? So. Uh, so I worry about a trade-off for the standard deduction. Even though the standard deduction goes up, um, there are other oh, things. Almost double. That's right, but there are other things that people lose if you itemize your state and local income taxes, your property taxes. Um, those things really hurt you. If you're a family that has, uh, you know, where you get uh, the individual mandate now is in place and it's taken away, for many families that means that their health care premiums are actually going to increase, which then affects uh, their quality quality of life. And so, you know, this really, I think, um, you know, it's not a reform of the tax code. And anybody that thinks that they're going to be able to put their taxes on a postcard, uh, I got something else I want to sell you because that's not true. That's what was promised. And this is not going to be a fair benefit for middle class families. Brian, I want you to join the debate on the merits, but also let's talk about the politics, because assuming that this does pass, as Secretary Mnuchin said, as everybody is saying, uh, this will be the first big legislative victory for Donald Trump. Trump. Uh, is it enough to go to the voters in 2018 and will it help them? 
Uh, it's going to be fascinating because we're actually going to have a legitimate report card in 2018. It's not who has the best slogan, who has the best message, who's better on the stump. It's going to say, I'm not, I'm not sure immigration is not going to get done in 2018 either, but let's say this is the only piece of major, major legislation. We're going to feel it in February. And if you're right, uh, Congresswoman, and people are paying more, and it's not working out, and the massive bunch of, uh, most of the American people say this is terrible, he's going to pay the price. But if things begin to improve, and the gro growth rate does go over four, and, and everything's on the right track right now, then that's all you can ask for. If you're President Trump and if you're a Republican, say, grade me on what I did. Now, when I watch Marco Rubio and I watch Senator Lee and I watch Senator Johnson all lobby hard to get what they want in this bill, I ask you, where are the five or six Democrats in conservative districts and states that could have done the same thing? If Joe Manchin put his hand up and said, you get me to 24, I'm in. John Tester, Heidi Heitkamp, why didn't they try to get in this debate? This was all a one party debate and it didn't have to be. Juan? Well, this is all about politics and it's all about the midterms. It's all about saying that Republicans in the first year of the Trump administration with a Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican control of the White House got something done. They didn't get Obamacare done. They haven't gotten an immigration plan done. They got something done. So let's look at the polls. Let's get away from all this and say, what do the American people this Sunday morning think about this plan? The majority not a plurality, a majority, more than 50% say this is a bad plan for themselves and for their families. Mike Bloomberg says this is a trillion dollar blunder. The Joint Center on Taxation, Goldman Sachs, say this is a bad plan for the economy. So this is not a political judgment. These are people, Goldman Sachs is in the money making business and they don't see this as good for them or for America. Instead, I think what you have is Republican donor, the donor class saying, yeah, this is what we want from Republicans. We want tax cuts. Well, and they're delivering on the tax cuts. But, uh, it's not as though Republicans just came up with this idea of tax, corporate tax reform out of the blue yesterday because they needed to pass something. President Obama Barack Obama, Obama talked about the importance of corporate tax reform. Bill Clinton talked about the importance of corporate tax reform because our system was out of whack with the rest of the world and was hurting us. But I think clear, that if you talk about tax reform, Rich, you've got to right. keep in mind that the actual rate that these corporations was paying is much lower because of deductions right, and the like. It's such a complicated system, and that makes no sense. That's why you want to lower the actual rate and, and knock out some of those special interest provisions. And yeah, this, but this, this is not a way. This, is, this is actually, let's be clear, this is not a tax reform package. It no. doesn't reform the tax code. What it does is it continues many of those special interest breaks. It gives gives additional uh, special interest treatment uh, to certain kinds of corporations and income, pass-through income being one of those things. And on top of that, it adds a trillion dollars to the deficit, and that by the Joint but, Center but on let me, Taxation. Let me, let me bring in uh, the point to both you, Congresswoman Edwards, and to you, Juan, as, as critics of this plan. The, the Trump economy is doing pretty well. We've got 3% growth, 4% unemployment, record highs every week in the stock market. If this uh, call, brings further stimulus to the economy, isn't that going to be a pretty powerful message going into 2018? It's a big if. I mean, the fact is, I mean, almost no economist tells you that uh, the growth rates that are being projected by uh, the uh, congressional Republicans is actually, and by Trump himself, is actually, actually going to create in this in this economy. And so it really is, I mean, it really is a mistake to call this, you know, sort of adding right. to the growth rate. If corporations wanted to put more money into the economy, they've got all the capital in the world to do that right now. There's nothing in right. this tax reform bill that incentivizes. I, I would say this. If you're running a major corporation, you're probably a uh, very bright man or woman. And you know this is a window of opportunity where you finally got the tax deduction that you said was keeping your money offshore and your investment away. Now, this is a window. If you don't take advantage of that window, if you just buy back your stock or keep it overseas, you're never going to get this opportunity. You're going to have a liberal Democrat in the office, and your life will never be as bad economically. And I will say this. The market's already weighed in. The prospect of having this passed boom the market and it continues to rise so Mike Bloomberg who wants to take your guns and take away the combustion oh, engine stop. also wants to be you against know, Donald Trump the minute he hates Donald the Trump. minute you, the, the minute, the minute you jump the broom there and start yeah. talking about guns I understand that you're in a losing position no, you understand? he Let wants just to hurt that. Donald Trump no, any way he can that's, this is not look let's just talk about taxes let's forget the you know politics of sport aspect of this and talk about the reality the reality is we have a very good economy right now stock 
market booming, low unemployment, good GDP that's growing. We're still struggling with wages and workforce participation. But the reality is that there is high income inequality in this country. Americans don't want what Paul Ryan's talking about, a huge deficit that then says, we're going to shrink the government and we're going to cut Social Security and Medicare well, next year. But don't wow. You see the standard deduction, though, don't you see some of the things built into this plan already? Built into this plan already that's going to help uh, the working class and help Where? the what, what helps really? the working because class? Because standard deduction. Gentlemen, oh. higher, oh. Growth, oh. higher growth helps but the working class. It Take it outside. <laughs> oh, my gosh. we got another, another <laughs> segment, and we'll have you back later in the show. Thank you. Uh, up next, Senator-elect Doug Jones. We don't want to miss him. His first appearance on Fox News since the start of the campaign on what he wants to do in Congress after his upset victory in Alabama. Doug Jones pulled off a stunning upset this week, becoming the first Democrat elected to the Senate in deep red Alabama since 1992. While his opponent, Judge Roy Moore, vows to fight on, President Trump called Doug Jones to congratulate him. The senator-elect joins us now live. Uh, Mr. Jones, congratulations and welcome to Fox News Sunday. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. Let's start with what you see as your role in the Senate starting early next year. Here's what you said on election night. We've tried to make sure that this campaign was about finding common ground and reaching across and actually getting things done for the people. Given the fact that Republicans control the House and the Senate and the White House, where do you see a, an opportunity to find common ground and work with President Trump? Well, you know, Chris, I, I think there's an opportunity at every turn. It doesn't matter what the issue is, there's always the opportunity to find common ground. You know, and I hope to have that voice. I said on election night uh, that I hope this is a message not to just Republicans, that we've got a Democrat who's willing to reach across the aisle. I hope it's a message to Democrats to try to find that common ground. You know, it's one of those things where you've got to reach across, you've got to try, but it's a two-way street. I mean, people have got to respond backwards, and that's why I'm I'm hoping uh, that we'll be able to do that with this new voice and a new, uh, I think, sense of enthusiasm coming out of the state of Alabama. Well, let's talk some specifics. It looks like uh, the Senate and Congress is going to pass the tax bill before you get to town. But if you were here this week, if you had a chance, would you vote for this bill or against it? Well, I got to be honest with you, Chris, that's a 500 page bill that just landed on people's desks just the other day. So I haven't had a real chance to, to, to look at that and study it, as has a lot of people have not, which is one of my biggest concerns about the way things are going up there right now. This is, seems to be done, plopped into a, a vote too quickly. Uh, there's obviously what I'm seeing and hearing and just reading about, there's things I, I like about it cutting uh, corporate tax rates, uh, cutting some things for the uh, uh, middle class and increasing the standard deduction. But my biggest concerns are the process and also the fact that it's gonna increase the deficit by over a trillion dollars. That causes me great concern. And I'm just very surprised that that's gonna go. I don't buy into the fact that uh, it's gonna grow the economy such that the, that, that trillion dollar debt will get wiped out. I think that's a major problem. So uh, we'll wait and see how it goes. We're gonna start looking at it just in case I'm up there ahead of time, but uh, it's a complicated bill. This is not the simplification process that we were all told about early on. 500 pages is a pretty complicated bill. Well, let's, let's talk about another one, and this is one that you may get a chance to vote on. Uh, immigration. Would you support a deal that fixes DACA, that protects the so-called DREAMers, but on the other hand has tougher border enforcement and includes some money uh, for continuing to build President Trump's wall? Well, I'd have to look. I, you know, I have said uh, before that I, I oppose the building of a wall. I think that's an expense that the taxpayers just don't have to incur because I do think you can increase 
uh, border security without having to go to the incredible expense of building that wall, at least the figures that I've seen. Uh, I do support uh, the DACA program and would love to see that extended. I hope there can be some bipartisan efforts reached uh, to do that. Immigration has been one of the toughest political footballs going on up there right now, and we've had bills in the past that just fell by the wayside because of politics. If there's comprehensive immigration, I think it's going to be very uh, complicated, uh, And but it's something that I, I, I would love to look at. I know it's been important to my state, although I'm not as sure it's as important as health care and some other things right now. But, but I mean, this is a good kind of case study, and, and we're talking theoretically, because obviously there's not a specific piece of legislation. Okay. There are things you want. You want the dock effects. Uh, are you, would you be willing, even though you're not crazy about the idea, to include some funding for the wall, which is something the president and Republicans want, if you get your half of a loaf? Well, let's, let's see how that shakes out. It's hard to talk in hypotheticals because right now you haven't seen anybody really kind of trying to reach those compromises. It's you know draw you know what I'm seeing up there is you draw a line in the sand uh, and you haven't had an opportunity to reach. I'm going to consider anything, Chris. I mean, look, I, I, I'm up here to try to, uh, as I've said before, to try to find that common ground. I know it sounds like a broken record. I also know that it sounds like it's just pure pie in the sky. But the fact is, we got to tr uh, try and, and, and look and try to do those things for the American public. So rather than just talking in hypotheticals, I'll leave all the options on the table with regard to that and try to come up with the right way to approach immigration or any other issue. President Trump called you the other day and invited you when you come to Washington to come visit him at the White House. But during the campaign, he said that you, if you were elected, would be a puppet of Democratic leaders Pelosi uh, and, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Here, here is uh, some clips from all of that. We don't need a liberal person in there, a Democrat, Jones. I've looked at his record. It's terrible in crime. It's terrible in the border. It's terrible in the military. He likes Doug Jones and looks forward to meeting him in person. So which Trump do you believe, the one before the election or the one after? I will, I'm going to believe the one after. You know, you say a lot of things during the in the heat of a campaign, and we were expecting uh, to, you know, that kind of a checklist of things. Uh, but his call to me was very gracious. It truly was. Uh, we had a very good talk, no substance, uh, but just kind of a personal call. I'm looking forward to, to meeting him. I'm looking forward to getting up there and trying to find those issues that we can work together on for both the country and uh, the state of Alabama. You know, it, it, the line of questioning that I've been engaged in, and I think that a lot of reporters, since you're very Victory is is answering the big question here in Washington, which is which kind of a Democrat will you be? You talk a lot about your mentor when you worked here in Washington in the Senate, Howell Heflin, who stepped down as Alabama's last Democratic senator 20 years ago. We have a picture up right now at a committee meeting, and there is Heflin, and there is a much younger Doug Jones right next to him. <laughs> Heflin was ranked as the Democrat with the most consistent record of support of any Democrat during his time in office for Ronald Reagan. Do you see yourself as the same kind of moderate or even conservative Alabama Democrat? You know, Chris, I, I'm just going to be candid about this. I have resisted trying to to put labels on myself. People are going to do that left and right. I, I've tried to resist that. I'm going to continue to resist that. Uh, I'm going to be a Doug Jones Democrat uh, for sure. I'm going to be looking at issues on both sides. I'm going to do what I, I believe is in the best interest of both the country uh, and my state. P other people will label me. Uh, I think the world has changed a little bit and I think politics has changed. And all I can do is to try to go forward with what I believe is the best thing to do. And that's, that's the only thing I can do. So. We'll see how this shakes out in the next uh, year or two to see what kind of labels you guys in the media uh, want to put on me. <laughs> and we will. Uh, two more questions I, I want to I, I get in. Uh, one, your opponent, Judge Moore, uh, continues to refuse to concede, says that this race is not over, and this week issued this video. Today we no longer recognize the universal truth that God is the author of our life and liberty. Abortion, sodomy, and materialism have taken the place of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What's your reaction to that? And do you think that Roy Jones is hurting Alabama by continuing this contest, continuing this fight? Well, I, I just have quit trying to figure out what Judge Moore 
means when he says things like that. It just, I, f I don't find it in the mainstream of America. I don't, certainly don't even find it in the mainstream of Alabama. Uh, I think it's time to move on. And I think he is hurting the uh, people of this state. I've told folks I want to try to represent everyone. I'm not going to uh, be a senator which people are going to agree with 100% of the time. But I am going to be the kind of senator that people can talk to, that we can reason with. I want to, to get an education from them. I want to educate the people. So I do think it's hurt and I think it's time to move on uh, and let's get, get beyond this divisive kind of rage the war rhetoric that you hear from, from him and others. Uh, final question. You're not up for re-election until 2020, but I want to ask you about the 2018 midterms because some folks say that your victory, as well as the victory of the Democrat and the governor's race in Virginia, put out a kind of blueprint, blueprint, a, a game plan for how Democrats should proceed in 2018. I want to put up some some numbers uh, on your victory. You won the black vote, 93% to 6. The younger vote, 62% to 36. Women, 55% to 43. And independents, 55 to 42. Question, how do other Democrats energize those pillars of the traditional party base for the 2018 midterms? Well, you know, Chris, I think that anybody that runs for, for office ought to talk to those people. I think that was one of the things that we did early on in our campaign. We went straight on issues. Uh, Roy Moore didn't talk about issues that, that we had in common. He talked about issues that divide us. And I think when you talk about those issues that you have in common, among all of those groups you just rattled off, every, every one of them have the same issues in common about health care, uh, education, jobs, the economy, trying to raise to a, a, a living wage. Those are the issues that people responded to. And I think that it, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, I think people now have to start focusing on those issues and not just depend on whether or not they're going to be some kind of straight ticket voting. Senator-elect Jones, thank you. Thanks for your time this weekend. And we'll see you up here in Washington pretty soon. Thanks, Chris. I look forward to it. And thanks for having me this morning. When we come back, the FBI under fire. The president launches tough new criticism of the agency. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about allegations of political bias in the FBI? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. It's a shame what's happened with the FBI, but it is very sad when you look at those documents and. How they've done that is really, really disgraceful. And you have a lot of very angry people that are seeing it. President Trump taking aim at the FBI after the release of anti-Trump text messages between two senior officials, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, who were involved in a special counsel investigation until last July. And we're back now with the panel. Well, Brian, the Washington Post had a story this weekend, I don't know if you saw it, that said that these texts back and forth between Strzok and Page were really an effort to cover up the fact right. that they were having an extramarital affair. And the question I have is, does that clear it all up for you? Yes, thanks. We have some time left in the segment, so I'll fill it. <laughs> uh, no, I, absolutely not. you got to be kidding me. They were, the, the one thing that stood out on the text messages more than anything else was the fact is they were building in a plan just in case on August 15th, and I think you even referred to it earlier in the show, on August 15th, they were going back and forth on a text message that talked about a plan just in case Donald Trump won. And he went on to say, just like having an insurance policy, well, let me, let, let, me, let, let me put this up and let's put it up on the screen if, you, if we can, guys. And this was a text that Peter Strzok sent to Lisa Page uh, on August 15, 2016. And it says, I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office. We think Andy was Andrew McCabe, the number two official in the FBI. The path, uh, the path you threw out in Andy's office that there's no way he, Trump, gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. Continue. What I'm trying to say is for any Republican who was worried or on the fence that there might have been some bias amongst the top level of the FBI when it comes to the investigation and against his candidacy, that is proof positive. Unless they're referring to Andy Griffith, who starred in Matlock, as well as his own <laughs> black and white TV series, who had a lot of success. But I couldn't proof see those. Proof positive of what? Uh, proof positive that there was an anti-Trump bias at the top. And Peter Strzok is all around this investigation, enough to make you want to probe. And that's what Jim Jordan indicated that Bob Goodlatte is going to be doing uh, when we get back from Christmas.
break. We asked you for questions for the panel, and we got this as a, a tweet from John H. Converse, who writes, we demand the military be apolitical on duty, even though we allow them to have political ideology. Is it too much to demand the same of the FBI, IRS, DO, DOG, Department of Justice? One, how do you answer John and Brian? Well, just as the military has political opinions, uh, you know, so do people who are jurors, who are lawyers, uh, who are judges, uh, who are FBI agents. We're but, human beings. But, but if, an, if a judge had, if we had read statements that were blatantly favoring one side against the other, they would be forced to refuse no, but themselves. that's not the point. The point is what not well, that you... Not your that point. You, no, no, no. <laughs> I was making... I'm speaking to your point. The fact that you write them down. I'm, my point is that you have these opinions. It's no question that people have opinions. The question is their integrity. Can they perform their job in an impartial way despite their opinions? And what we know is that according to the Attorney General Jeff Sessions, the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, and the FBI Director Chris Wray just this week, all have said the FBI is performing its jobs yeah, very they, well. Wait, 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 they weren't wait, saying wait, that about Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. That's, this is a total distraction. Let me just say, this whole discussion <laughs> is so interesting to me because it's all part of the Trump legal team assault on the integrity of law enforcement in this country intended to, dis to distract Not people the rank and file. distract people from the potential the investigation into ties between the Trump campaign and its officials uh, these and Russian right. interference and this is all a setup okay. potentially to all fire right. Bob Mueller Deputy, well, we'll They're get to that in a minute. It. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein testified before uh, Congress this week, and he took some heavy fire from Republicans on just this issue. Take a look. How with a straight face can you say that this group of Democrat partisans are unbiased and will give President Trump a fair shake? We recognize we have employees with political opinions, and it's our responsibility to make sure those opinions <clears throat> do not influence their actions. And we hope that he was yeah. able to clear the fraud in his throat. <laughs> but, but Congresswoman, look, nobody is talking. Let, this is a red herring. Nobody is talking about the FBI in general. Everybody agrees that it's a good, solid agency. We're talking about individual actors here. When you read those texts where they just trash uh, uh, Trump, they say that he's loathsome, that he's an idiot, and then specifically this August 2016 one where they talk about, you know, we've got to have an insurance policy in case he gets elected, you don't find that troubling? And so what? I mean, it, you know, the fact is that you have two employees who were having an affair. They were taken off the investigation in July last year. And now you have a series of indictments that have come from the Mueller team. And this line of questioning, attacking Mueller and attacking the investigation based on a couple of employees who had an affair and were covering that up and writing stupid emails. So what? I mean, look, uh, a lot of these texts, they are stupid, they are embarrassing, they're not necessarily sinister. The sinister one is, is the insurance policy text. The and one we need, we've been talking we, about. Right. We need to hear from Strzok under oath about what he meant by that. I also think there's enough now to be worried about this investigation. I think Bob Mueller, for his own good, should dismiss Andrew Weissman, who's a Democratic partisan, his top deputy, also sent an anti-Trump email. And Jeff Sessions should bring in an outside district attorney who has some independence to look into the entirety of how DOJ and the FBI handled 2016 and to get to the bottom of it. But, but if Donald Trump takes from all this a permission slip to fire huh. Bob Mueller, it would be a catastrophic mistake. And the irony is here, as far as we know, it looks like Mueller is not turning up evidence of collusion. So I think if Trump could just sit tight, Mueller probably will vindicate him at the end of the day, and firing him will do more damage to Trump than just sitting this out. I talked to three different White House officials, and that is what Congresswoman Spire said is total fiction. There is no interest in firing Yeah, wait, Mueller. we should point out, what, what did she say? And when she came out and said that there's word is, and a rumor on the Hill that before Christmas he's going to make a major speech and say Mueller's fired, investigation over. They said we haven't even discussed that in private conversations. It has not come up. Three different people uh, uh, who work at the White House just to make sure that uh, I had the right information for you because I know you d demand it. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, don't go single uh, source exactly. on this. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know. Chris Biles, yeah, true professional. This is like Watergate here. And, I, and I know I got two great people here to, to debate with, so that's not going to happen. But what happens? They are. The, Trump wants this to end. He 
wants to see what it's like to have a presidency without this hanging over its well, head. Then he needs to stop attack attacking uh, this the is real, special this counsel. Is he needs to this stop attacking substance. Mueller, and he needs to let the he needs to let the investigation not, play out. Well, it hasn't, has not it hasn't gone stopped after Mueller. his allies on the Hill from attacking because they Mueller. Because they're finally understanding that there's something to attack. DC, has there ever been an independent counsel, special counsel investigation of a president that hasn't engendered a partisan reaction? I. I uh, we all recall the 1990s, and the Democrats were not very uh, nice to Ken Starr. If yeah, I remember correctly. Fine, but this is this takes it to a new level, Rich. I think if, you know people talk about Colin Kaepernick, Black Lives Matter, undermining trust in our police. They did nothing as comparable to what this president has done to the FBI at this moment. Well, the FBI has also hurt its own credibility. All right. You know what I liked about this panel? I had to do very little work. <laughs> Thank you, panel. See you next Sunday. Up next, our Power Player of the Week, the remarkable woman who took these powerful pictures from the front lines. If you ever read the New York Times or National Geographic or Time Magazine, chances are you've seen her work, riveting photographs that bring the savagery of the front lines into your home. Here is our Power Player of the Week. I never consider myself brave. I just consider myself very sort of committed to the story. And that takes me to places that are dangerous. <laughs> Lindsay Adario is one of the great photojournalists of the last two decades. Just listen to where she's worked since 9-11. I've covered Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Darfur, Congo, South Sudan, Somalia. Question. Why? There are great injustices that go on in war zones, and it's uh, fundamental for someone to be there to document that. Darfur, 2004. There were skeletons across the desert, people fleeing for their lives. Uh, we witnessed villages that had been burned to the ground. With U.S. troops in Afghanistan's Korangal Valley in 2007. I woke up, I put on my night vision, took this picture, and fell back asleep. In Pakistan's no man's land tribal area with the Taliban in 2009 for a story that won the Pulitzer Prize. If they invite you to their home, they will not kill you. They will protect you with their lives. So we knew that, or we hoped that once we got there, um, because we had been invited, they would not kill us. The New York Times says four of its journalists reporting on the conflict in Libya are now missing. But Adario's luck almost ran out. <laughs> when she and three colleagues were taken prisoner by Qaddafi's forces in 2011. They were about to execute us and were literally, at one point I looked over and I saw each one of my colleagues literally begging for, for their lives. And I remember I could barely speak and I just said, please. And at that moment, a commander came over and said, you can't kill them, they're American. Adario and the others were beaten and held for six days, but then finally released. Two months later, she went back to work. Not on the front lines, but still in Gaza and Afghanistan and Senegal. And by now, she was pregnant. Did your family, did your friends, did you question what the heck you were doing? The fact is, I was pregnant and I was surrounded by pregnant women and, oh my God, it was the most natural thing. I always feel like I'm in the wrong place. When I'm here, I want to be there. When I'm there, I want to be home. Adario's son, Lucas, is now almost six. When she comes home, he sits on her lap while she edits her pictures, sometimes of war refugees. He asked about war, and I say, oh, it's fighting, and some people get killed. And he said, well, then, Mommy, can't you get killed? And to me, that's like, how do I answer that? Because I can't just lie to him. And so I just say, I'll be fine. So why does she do it? Why has she risked her life these last two decades? Why does she keep risking her life, with Lucas waiting for her back home? I don't need to take pretty pictures anymore. It's not at all about the, you know, just being there to travel and take a picture. It's really about the storytelling, about journalism, about truth, about uh, telling people stories, about making people care about things that they wouldn't necessarily care about. But, you know, I just keep working. I think that this for me is my calling and my mission and uh, that's what I believe in. Lindsay Adaria wrote a memoir which is now in development as a movie starring Jennifer Lawrence. Her story is called, It's What I Do. And that's it for today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Fox News Sunday.